the Congressional Caucus on Women's Issues, made up of both men and women from the Hill, then had a general accounting office uh, look audit of the NIH to see whether or not, with this policy encouraging and urging inclusion, whether or not it was being done. And that report, in fact, reported that there was no consistent inclusion. In other words, people who existed, but how many investigators were submitting studies still not including women, not including uh, minorities in their study populations, and were still getting funded. So as a result of that, the NIH set up, in response to the members of Congress, set up the Office of Research on Women's Health with the primary responsibility to ensure that women, and you can't separate women and people of color, so the primary responsibility and the reason this office was set up was to ensure that women and minorities in their subpopulations are included in clinical studies funded by the NIH to make sure that actually happened. And actually then we developed other aspects related to research and agendas, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. I really want to talk about the inclusion and picking up from where we've gone since the other policies and regulations were put in place. So with that, then the government or Congress said, okay, NIH, you said before you had a policy urging and encouraging the inclusion of women and minorities, but we want to make sure that happens. So in 1993, in the Reauthorization Act of the National Institutes of Health, there was a section in that act uh, called Clinical Equity and Clinical Research that put into law, remember this was a policy that became a matter of public law of this country that states that the director of NIH must ensure that women and minorities and their subpopulations are included in research funded by the NIH. As far as I've been able to tell, we're the only country in the world where we actually have a law that requires broad inclusion. Now, the interesting thing is, and remember, this was part of the NIH Reauthorization Act, so it does not apply, the law is not applicable to other components of government, it does not apply to industry. And so for those of you who sit on IRBs, I'm sure you've had to deal with investigators who have had funding from NIH where they're required to meet certain, certain standards in terms of projected populations for participation, because if they're getting NIH funding, they must do that. But if they're being also partially funded by industry, they don't have that requirement. And sometimes can lead to, a, to some discussion, shall I say, or conflict in terms of review. But just think about it. We actually now have a law. So to me, that's the next step beyond looking at protection, but then to go where sometimes that protection was used to exclude populations, um, that we now have a law that requires inclusion. And basically, the law indicated that, that, as I've already stated, must ensure that women and minorities are included in clinical studies. Dr. Williams referred to the point of cost. This law actually stated so that some investigator couldn't say, well, I'm not going to reach out to include women, or I'm not going to reach out to get minorities, because that's going to be too expensive. It said that cost could not be a factor to not implement this law. So cost could not be a factor. Now, we all know that cost is a factor. <coughs> and certainly designing research studies and looking at what, especially looking at the state of the budget right now, uh, that there's not, a, there's not unlimited funds. But it does mean that in designing a research study and looking to see who you're going to include in that study, the design of the study must reach out and include those populations that are affected. Obviously, you don't need to include every population, every subpopulation, if they're not affected. And in fact, looking at representation of women or minority uh, subgroups really is supposed to be related to and is up to the investigator to describe and justify, based on the scientific literature of the data, uh, the representation of the study that is, is representative of the prevalence of the condition of the study in the general population. Not just in the general population where you live, but the general population as we know it in general. And that also one of the things that came up when this went into, went into effect in 1994, uh, we got, it was interesting because there had been complaints about including women, but when the law was passed requiring that minorities must be included also, we didn't hear any more complaints about we can't get women. The major complaints that came in were, well, we don't have minorities in our area, so we're not going to, we can't put minorities in our studies. 
And we sort of refer to that as the Minnesota Vermont response because we got more letters from Minnesota than Vermont. And if you think about it, there are minorities in those areas, but just people had narrow visions, I think, who wrote those letters. And remember, when you write to the government, that's public information. So I quoted those letters widely when they came in so that people could see. But that led to really many, many instances of pointing out the importance of collaborative efforts. If you're designing a study that affects the population, uh, that includes minorities or includes women, and you don't have them in your, your, your area where you are, you establish a liaison with an institution or a hospital or a clinic in some other part of the country or some other area where you can bring in those populations. And those are the kinds of things that are to be considered and now are considered, and I hope they'll still be since I've gone, uh, by the NIH and reviewing research studies. That's sort of what I've been doing for the last 20 years heading up that office. Uh, now, I have to...